Well, 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 good morning. I don't know about you all, but that song put some pep in my step. I enjoyed that song a lot. Well, good morning. Um, I just want to say how happy I am to be here today and be able to just uh, talk with you guys. And this more, I am more happy that it's even spring, finally. And it's going to start getting warmer eventually. <laughs> Hopefully. But before we get started, I, I have to share something with you. I don't know if you guys have seen this or not, but there's something going around here at New Hope. And it's been going on for a long time. And it's actually gotten out of control. And what I'm talking about is this vest epidemic. <laughs> I have no idea who this person is. <laughs> but this person started this. Seriously, every Sunday, there's not a Sunday that I come in here where I don't see somebody wearing one of these. And the thing is, is we all have bought cars before, right? And when you go to get that car, you look at that car and you're like, man, this is a one of a kind. Nobody has this car. But as soon as you get your car, what happens? You notice it everywhere you go, right? That's the same thing that's going to happen with these vests. <laughs> I have pointed it out to you, and every Sunday, you're going to see somebody. I don't know who it's going to be, but you'll see somebody wearing one of these vests. The thing is, is I really wore this just to be funny, but man, I honestly like them. <laughs> I do. Like, I can put my hands in them when I get cold, and it's nice and warm. And I look at these things, and I think of, I think of they're like the, the mullets for clothes. <laughs> and what I mean by that is we all know what a mullet is, right? It's the hairdo. It's sophisticated in the front and what? Party in the back. That's what I'm talking about. So these are sophisticated around the torso and party in the sleeves. I love it. So if you get too warm with the, where the, vest, the vest is going, you just let some air come in and you get cooled off. It's like air conditioning for clothes. I love it. But as much as I love these vests, there is something that I love even more about them is I am fat and you can't tell because this vest <laughs> covers it. And I love it. And to those who are watching this at home, remember that camera adds 150 pounds. I'm just letting you know. But I know, I, I do love these vests, but I do love more than anything to be able to share with you guys to continue the conversation about the armor of God because I truly believe, without a shadow of a doubt, this is one of the most important things that Christians need to know and understand. And the reason why I believe this is because they, we have a real enemy amongst us. We have a real spiritual enemy. See, Satan isn't just some Halloween character that is made up so we have something to dress up as on Halloween for trick-or-treating. He is not someone that is made up just so I can scare you all, we can scare you all to come to church. He is as real as you and as me. And he's very, very powerful. And the thing is, he has broken many men and he has broken many women. He has deceived and lied to all of us daily. He has made us question our faith and made, made us question ourselves. He is good at his job. He is slicker than grass through a goose. He knows what he's doing. He is great at it. And the thing is, is most Christians walk around like, we got this. Like, I don't need anything to help me. But the truth is, my friends, we ain't got this. We ain't as good as we think we are because we are weak and we need protection. And when I talk about protection, I'm not talking about the protection that the culture that we live in today makes us think about selfish protection. Like I need to protect my reputation. I need to protect my image. I need to protect my feelings. 
I'm not talking about that protection. I'm talking about protection where we protect our souls. How many of us truly spend time in protecting our souls? Which is more important, your reputation or your soul? What is the one that you will have for eternity? This is why the past couple of weeks, Pastor Shane has talked about to you guys about um, the armor of God. So in week one at the beginning of the series, we learned about the belt of truth. To be grounded in the truth and to have a stable foundation. With this belt of truth, which I'm wearing, you can't see because my vest is covering it, <laughs> is something that, it is that, that we know that we learned that it's not good enough just to know the truth, but to live it out, to be ready and prepared for battle. And like Pastor Shane said, we have to gird our loins. We need to. And after that, what did we learn about? We learned about the body armor of righteousness. And I loved what Pastor Shane said about it. When we put our faith in Jesus, we are made right with God, and he sees the righteousness of Jesus in us. Last week, we talked about the shoes of peace. We need to be ready and prepared to move forward with the good news. Are we moving forward? I'm about to read God's word to all of you. And you guys are more than welcome to follow along in your personal Bibles. We got Bibles in the back of these chairs if you didn't bring one to follow along with me. You also have your uh, smartphones and tablets and all that stuff you can follow along with me. But I'm telling you right now, everything that I'm reading out of God's word will be on these screens. And I would love for me to be able to just read to you with my amazing voice, God's word. All right, so we're gonna start off with the number that I cannot stand saying, but Ephesians 16. And it says, a final word, be strong in the Lord and its mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you'll be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, not against evil rulers, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you'll be fully prepared. In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Let's read that first part right there again. In addition to all of these, what Paul is saying is not only are we supposed to pick up the shield of faith, not only are we supposed to wear the belt of truth, not only are we to wear the body armor of righteousness, and not only are we supposed to wear the shoes of peace, but addition to, to have them all on, not just one or two pieces, because we need to have all of the armor on so we can be covered from head to toe and be ready for battle. So let's continue. In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. And this shield that Paul is talking about isn't one of these toy shields you see kids playing with now and day. This is a Captain America one. And I know I look just like the guy on the movie. I get that. But this right here is not going to protect me. Not even wearing this vest. It will not protect me. Because it's too small. Right? But if we look at this picture, look at the size of the shield compared to that Roman soldier. This is the size of the shields they used to use back in the first century. They, were, they had to be big enough to protect them when literally fiery arrows were being shot at them. Thing is, is we are called to pick up our shield of faith, our shield which is faith. As Christians, we need to extinguish and block all the attacks that are shot our way from the enemy. What are these attacks? I am so glad that you asked me, because I want to tell you. 
what they are is that Satan wants more than anything to make you doubt the promises of God. And for most of my life, I believe Satan. I believe Satan because I didn't allow God to come into my life. I believed him because most of my life, I felt like God didn't love me. I felt like if he did love me, that half the things that happened to me would not have happened. I doubted the promises of God because I chose to listen to Satan. I chose to let him convince me he was right and God was wrong. I let the fiery arrows hit me. All of you in this room, all of you in this world have all let the fiery arrows hit you as well. Not literal ones, because if you did, that would hurt but spiritual ones. All of us had Satan tell us lie after lie and make us doubt our faith. That is because we haven't trusted in the promises of God. Many of you are experiencing it right now. It is that one sin in your life that you can't seem to conquer. That one sin that you're fighting with daily, that you're battling with daily. Then you start believing these lies that Satan is telling you. You start to believe that you're not good enough to get over that sin. And then you even start thinking that you're not even saved. Because if I was really saved, I wouldn't have this battle. It wouldn't be this hard. We start to justify our actions and second guess our beliefs. Just as Satan encouraged Eve about to doubt God's direction for her and Adam. This is what Satan told her. You won't die if you eat of the fruit. God knows that your eyes will be open as soon as you eat it and be like God and know both good and evil, which planted that seed of doubt just enough to have them both eat of the tree of, the good, of, of good and evil, of knowledge of good and evil, and he helped them doubt the promises of God, which led to sin. And Satan is doing the same thing that he did then, now. He truly is. He's putting doubts with what God says. Like, did God really say that I can't have sex before marriage? Does God really want what's best for me? Did God really say that I can't judge people? Does God really say I have to love everybody? even if they're mean to me, even if I don't like them. And my favorite one is, does God really love me if he allows me to suffer? These are all doubts that we all feel most of the time that Satan continues to tell us. So today I want to share with you all how we hold up the shield of faith and defend ourselves against the fiery attacks of Satan, against the lies that Satan is telling us. And to understand how to do that, we must first understand what faith is, basic faith, and true biblical faith is. So basic faith is this, complete trust or confidence in someone or something. Most of us have complete trust in someone or something, don't we? Heck no, we don't. We don't trust nobody but ourselves, right? I know for me, we, I don't trust anybody when it comes to driving. I hate riding in the passenger side of a car. But that is why they invented the old crap handles. <laughs> right there on the window for those moments. It's not literally to help people get into the car. It's for those old crap moments in our lives when we're driving. And if you don't believe me or understand, ride with Pastor Shane from Indy to Columbia City in a snowstorm and you'll know what I'm talking about. Literally, you'll be white knuckling that handle the whole time. You might have to come home and change your pants. It is scary. It is very, very scary. So what most of us do have is somewhat faith. We somewhat believe we're going to be okay, but we're not 100% sure. And for us who have kids who have, had, who have their license or who have the permit, understand the somewhat faith. Amen, right? Because we're somewhat okay letting our kids drive us around town at 20 miles per hour. But you put me in a car the first time they go on the highway, my faith doesn't even exist anymore. 
I start sweating. I start panicking. I start yelling, or I'm sorry, I start getting passionate with my kids. I do. It scares you. And you all understand. You all know what I'm talking about. So with saying all that, I can conclude that faith in another person is very, very hard. So having faith, complete trust or confidence in someone or something is hard for us to do with things we see. How hard is it for us to have faith in the things that we can't see, like God? And this is where true biblical faith comes in. Let's read what Hebrews 11.1 1 says. Faith is the confidence that we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things we cannot see. So even though we can't see God or see the bigger picture of what he is doing, we can trust him. We can comp completely trust him and completely put all confidence in him. So like I said, if basic faith is described as complete trust or confidence of someone or something, this is how I would define biblical faith. The unwavering hope in the promises of God. So with the shield of faith, we can say that is the shield of unwavering hope, trust, confidence, and conviction in the promises of God. We cannot think of the shield as a Ferrari, something we have but never use, something that we are too scared to drive so it stays in the garage and all we do is look at it. We need to look at it as a Ford Focus. Something you will need and use daily. Something to take with you everywhere you go that gives you amazing gas mileage. I know because I have one. But the thing is, the shield is not just to look at. The shield is meant to be used. And a lot of us have that one-time faith. Faith is that one time that I came to know Christ. Faith is more than that. It is not a one-time thing. It is an all-the-time thing. It is a Ford Focus. It's a Dodge Caravan. It's a 15-passenger van for those who can't stop having kids. That's what it is. And faith is something that sustains us, not just something to use when we feel like we need it. If we treated faith as something that is only used when we need it, it would eventually die and Satan's lies will seep in. And you, we will become how I used to be, doubtful in the promises of God and eventually just give up. The thing is, is we can't think of our faith as an emotion or a feeling either. Only when I feel good and feel like God is there, I will have faith. Listen to me, that is called emotionalism. Spiritual intimacy without biblical knowledge and holy obedience. I will say it again, it is called emotionalism. Spiritual intimacy without biblical knowledge and holy obedience. Our feelings become our filter for truth instead of God's word and his promises. We focus more on God making us feel good rather than acknowledging God as good and he keeps to his promises. When this happens, we start to expect God to serve us instead of us serving God. Although it is good for us to think of our faith in the good times, because it is, but it's even more important for us to think of our faith in the bad times when it's not so good. How many of us ever had that amazing relationship with God when everything is going like you want it to. Everything is going great. Everyone loves God. Everyone believes in God when everything is going great. But as soon as something goes wrong, our faith is no longer seen. We get upset and stop trusting God and we start trusting ourselves, putting our faith in ourselves. And that is why it's so important for you to keep your shield up always, because it's meant to be used always, not sometimes. This is what C.S. Lewis says about faith. Now, faith in the sense of which I am here using the word is the art of holding on to things your reason has once accepted in spite of your changing moods. 
What he is saying is our faith is a shield of assurance and conviction, not emotions. There are a lot of people in the Bible who have held their shield of faith up always. But there's one whom I think did it the best, Job. That dude had anything bad can happen to somebody happen to him. Seriously, he lost all of his money, he lost his family, he lost his health, he lost it all. But through it all, did Job ever lose his faith in God? No, he amped it up. This is what Job said after he lost his livestock, which was his livelihood, after he lost most of his servants and after he lost all of his children. This is what he said. I came naked from my mother's womb and I will be naked when I leave. The Lord gave me what I had and the Lord has taken it away. Praise the name of the Lord. Now that's faith. That is complete trust. That is the unwavering hope and the promises of God. And the thing is, is Job isn't better than you or me. Job has the same God that we have. Job has the same armor that we have. Job had the same shield of faith that we have. The only difference in us and him is he knew how to use it all the time, not just sometimes. He knew how to drive his Ford Focus. So, with saying all of that, there are two things we need to know to be able to use the shield of faith effectively in our lives. Number one is this. We must know the promises of God. Look, Satan is a liar. We have already stated that. He is. He'll tell you whatever he wants to tell you to make you push you away from God. He will, he will tell you everything you want to hear because that's what we want. We want to hear what the world wants to tell us. But that is why it's so important that we know God's promises because if we don't know them, how can we defend ourselves with what Satan is telling us? If we don't know the promises, we can believe the lies that are told to us. So it is crazy to me how much things we know that doesn't really matter. Honestly, it is March Madness time and we all have our favorite team with our favorite players and with, we know all their names, we know all their stats. But honestly, what good does that do for us? Honestly. We know all the quotes to our favorite movies and we know all, every single lyric to our favorite songs. But a lot of us don't know the promises of God. Knowing the song lyrics from the devil went down to Georgia ain't gonna help you when the fiery arrows come your way. It may make you pick up a fiddle and play chicken in the bread pan picking out dough. I, however that's said, chicken in the bread pan picking out dough. But it won't make you, but it won't make you Stop the fiery arrows that are shot at you. It won't. So earlier when I spoke about that one sin in our lives that we struggle to conquer, that's one sin that we've been battling with and we've been fighting with, that one sin that keeps, seems to overwhelm us, beat us down, and make us feel worthless. Remember that? So here's my question to you. Are you going to continue to allow Satan to give in and let, you, and let him lie to you for the 1,000th time over and over and let him win? Or are you going to pick up your shield of faith and remember God's promises like in Isaiah 41.10? Do not, don't be afraid for I am with you. Don't be discouraged for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. These are the promises of God that we need to remember. Know that God will help you and that he will strengthen you. Don't be afraid or discouraged. Don't allow your emotions to take over and make you feel like God is not there when you are hurting. Remember Psalms 
34, 18, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. These are the promises of God that we need to remember. Don't allow Satan to make you think otherwise. Hold up your shield of faith, your shield, which is faith, and block all those fiery arrows that are coming towards you. Stop all those lies that Satan is going to tell you. He's going to make you doubt more and more every single day. And the thing is, is the more that you get in your relationship closer to God, the more that doubt is going to happen. The more those lies are going to happen. Literally, after the first time I preached this this morning, after I got done, I felt defeated. Like, oh man, I'm just no good. This, but that's Satan telling me that. Because he knows that God can use me. And I'm not going to allow Satan to win because I want to stick to the promises of God because God always prevails. So many of you may be thinking, how do you know that God keeps to his promises? How do you know that they will happen, Chris? Well, I'll tell you why. But people ask all the time, how can you be so confident in God's promises how, how, you don't understand, you don't understand what I'm going through. You don't understand the struggles that happen in my life. And this is what I say to them. How do I know? Because God says so. Show me a time in God, where God's word has ever failed. It hasn't. Satan may be powerful, but God's word is even more powerful. So 2 Corinthians says this, for all of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes. And through Christ, our amen, which means yes, ascends to God for his glory. It is God who enables us along with you to stand firm for Christ. He has commissioned us and he has identified us as his own by placing the Holy Spirit in our hearts as the first installment that guarantees everything he has promised. God guarantees everything that he promises. So if number one is we must know the promises of God, number two is this, we need to look to the founder of our faith. And it is written in Hebrews Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. When a person is going to be running a race, what do they do? They train for it, right? For they make sure they have exactly what they need and nothing more. I am assuming this because I don't run races. But this is what I'm assuming that they do. They make sure they're not, not wearing more things that weigh them down because why? They want to run the race with efficiency. So we need to get rid of what is weighing us down in God's race. Being a Christian involves hard work. It is not easy. And that is another lie that Satan makes us feel, that it has to be easy when we become Christians. It's not. It is hard. And it requires us to give up whatever sin that separates us from God so that we can run with endurance. When I used to do therapy, I would teach my patients energy conservation techniques to help them with their endurance in completing daily tasks. I would teach them to sit rather than stand to complete a task. I would teach them to uh, break up tasks into smaller steps and rest in between. To not use their hands above their shoulders because as you raise your hands above your shoulders it becomes more taxing on your body. And as a pastor now, I'm teaching you all energy conservation techniques. Get rid of what is weighing you down. Get rid of that one thing or many things that is holding you back. Give it to God so you can run the race that God has set before you. And more importantly, keep your eyes 
on Jesus. Don't look away. Because what happens when you're running on a road and you look away, you can trip, you can fall, some things can happen. Guess what? That's the same thing that can happen to us in God's race. When you take your eyes off Jesus, I'm telling you, it ain't gonna, might, it is gonna happen. You will fall, you will stumble. So keep your eyes on Jesus. Quit looking at yourself to know what to do and quit looking at others to know what to do. How many times have other people let you down, hurt you, deceived you, and even confused you more? Quit looking where you shouldn't and look to Jesus who will never confuse you, deceive you, hurt you, or let you down. Quit running to others and run to Jesus. He is the founder and perfecter of our faith. It is Jesus who gives us the shield. When we look at this battle we're fighting, it is not against flesh and blood. Like it says in Ephesians 6.12, it says, it is against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly place. This is the battle we are fighting. Not about how many of your friends didn't like your Instagram post or your Facebook post, because who cares? The battle that we are fighting is which Satan wants us to be weak because if we are, we are no good for God's kingdom. He wants you to think that you're not good enough. He wants you to doubt the promises of God. He wants you to take your eyes off Jesus. But let's take up our shield of faith and be confident in God's promises. Who cares what Satan wants? Who cares if Satan doesn't like it? Because like the wise words from amazing preschool church song, and if the devil doesn't like it, he can sit on attack. Ouch. Seriously. Who cares? what Satan wants. Let's remember God's promises and keep our eyes upon Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, I just, I thank you for each and every person that's in here in this room today, Lord, that their hearts are open and their minds are open to hear your word and to come closer to you, to know you and want to have a relationship with you, Father. I pray that you help each and every one of us to stick to your promises, to not allow Satan to dig into our hearts and our minds and make us think otherwise. Allow us to be strong with you and continue to read your word so we know what your promises are and we can grow confidence in those, Lord. I pray that you help us keep our eyes upon your son so we can run this race the way that you call us to run it. Lord, as this next song is about to play, I'm, I want to ask people if they want to come up here to come up here because I truly feel like some people need to just get things off their hearts and come confess to you, Lord. But I know that Satan's going to come in here and put doubt in their hearts and put these feelings in their brains to make them think that they shouldn't. I pray, Lord, that you lift that from them and give them the ability to come forth to this stage and come confess their love for you. Be with them be with us as a church and continue to allow us to love you in your son's precious name. Amen.